Thanks for attending, uh, everyone. So uh, my name is Peter Gorman, and last year I convened the Big Data Special Interest Group, and this year I'll again uh, be running the group. And today, uh, very happy uh, to have a speaker from Los Angeles. Um, and the topic for this year was data security and privacy. And when I saw one uh, present at the University of Texas uh, Data Science Day, uh, one had a fantastic story to tell about uh, open data and, and you know, geographic data, something that's very, very relevant to a community and, and has a great story to tell. Uh, so, yeah, with, uh, we're ready to roll. Yeah, so we're on now. Um, just quickly, everyone, a little bit of logistics. Um, this is a really interactive webinar, so you'll see a Q&A button down on the bottom of your screen. Please feel free to send questions through, um, and we'll get to those as we go through the presentation. Um, there's also a couple of poll questions which will pop up during a presentation. Um, we'd really love to get your feedback on that. Um, but without further ado, Juan, we'd love to hear presentation today. All right. Hello, everybody. I thank you all for having me. Super excited to be sharing some of our story from my work at the mayor's office. Um, my name is Juan Vasquez, and I will soon flip over to my slide. I just want to say a few things. Uh, I am coming out of a cold, so if my voice is a little raspy, I apologize. Uh, I'll make sure to speak slowly. And if I get the sense that maybe we have some connection issues, I'll just pause and be quiet until we for sure have everybody on. Uh, so now let me switch on over to my presentation so I can share some of my work with you all. Okay. You should all be seeing building LA's real estate portfolio. Is that correct? Beautiful. Right. Excellent, excellent. So let me go here just to make sure I can see everybody as well. All right, so again, Juan Vasquez, at Juan S. Vaz on Twitter. That same extension, Juan S. Vaz, is my LinkedIn profile. So if you want to connect or have any questions after this is all said and done, I encourage you all to follow up with me. I am a data strategist at the mayor's operate at the city of Los Angeles. Uh, with the mayor's operations innovation team. I will speak a little bit to the infrastructure later on, but really I'm here to share with you all how we've approached building LA's real estate portfolio. Uh, we've really leveraged open data and a variety of tools and strategies and creative problem solving to make this happen. So I'm really eager to share it with you all. Before we dive in, I wanna provide a little context for uh, Los Angeles. So the metro area is about 4 million residents plus, and the city itself is 470 plus square miles. Some of our key industries are health tech, biotech, a lot of innovation work happening in transportation, of course, uh, entertainment. There's a lot of real estate development happening here. Uh, we're a growing and booming startup capital, so there's a lot of small and very nimble companies doing a lot of stuff, very incredible product making. Uh, our transportation system is, is growing and becoming more and more advanced. We're also a really young city. Um, and there's a lot of spaces for interest and collisions to happen. Some of the most important issues that are relevant to our city are homelessness. Uh, if we are not the number one homeless capital of the world, which I believe we are, uh, we're definitely in the top three. Part of this is we have great weather. Uh, another is that we have a lot of ample space and a lot of transportation and lo roads and trains lead to Los Angeles. Uh, that's not to say that all of our homeless residents or individuals struggling with homelessness are from Los Angeles. We have a lot of cases where people come from all parts of the, of the country. Um, affordable housing is another, another issue or shortage of affordable housing. We are a, a place, a potential target for terror attacks. Uh, also natural disasters like earthquakes. But additionally, we suffer from, from drought, so a lack of water. But interestingly enough, our infrastructure is not built in a way that can support a lot of water. So we're also susceptible to flooding. I share all of this context because all of this is impacted by real estate and by our built environment. And especially when we talk about city owned land, all of our, our city assets can be engines to address and solve a lot of these issues. So a little context there for Los Angeles. 
Now, the way we'll guide this discussion is as follows. I will first share my team's vision. We have three initiatives. I'll share the vision for a real estate initiative. I'll then talk a little bit about what things were like in September 2015, which is when my team started work. So you get a sense of where we were at before the O team, which is what we're affectionately referred to as. Uh, I'll explain our team's goals. Uh, something that's not reflected on the slide, I'm actually going to share a handful of victories that we've accumulated. So we're talking about a lot of systems that we're implementing, a lot of new tools. Before I go into our data journey, I want you all to be aware of some of the successes we're already seeing. As you all might know from your work environments, especially in highly bureaucratic environments, accumulating small victories quickly and validating ideas and tools and projects very important for long-term success. So I want to highlight that. Then we'll go into our, our data journey. Lastly, I'll share some next steps uh, for, for our project and then uh, just general open Q&A. Uh, I think it's important that this is a conversation and I know you all probably have uh, different questions that will surface as the conversation goes on. So I'm excited to learn with you all, uh, but then also excited to learn with you and hopefully I share some important information. So a little bit about framework in the mayor's office. What you're seeing here is the mayor's office of budget and innovation. I share this uh, and, and my team resides within that. So not everybody you're seeing is my team. We're actually a very small, like four person, five person team. Uh, but I highlight this because we're one of the few cities that has married budget with the, all of the work that falls under the umbrella of innovation, which to me means a lot of system modernization, digitization of workflows and processes, modernizing of infrastructure. Uh, so having high level buy-in at the leadership level and being able to easily have conversations with the people that manage our budget and our funds is really important because as we configure systems and do data work, we have to talk about what does this system look like when my team is no longer in place? What's the sustainability of the system? And that means that you have to secure dollars in advance to ensure that that system will continue. So important note there on general city infrastructure, we're one of the few to do that. Let's talk about vision. As I mentioned, my team has three initiatives. The vision for a real estate initiative is, is really focused on real estate excellence. And the way we accomplish that is by leveraging innovation, leadership, and intellectual capital. But the focus here is real estate excellence, a little bit of an intangible. Um, how do you measure that? How do you define it? There, there is an exact KPIs or, or anything that you can exactly go to. It is something to aspire to. And it is something that helps us uh, accomplish our work as we battle through some of the highly bureaucratic waters of City Hall. Um, and so just know that that is something that we've used as a guiding light and really also to get buy-in at all levels. A lot of our work is starts with getting buy-in at the leadership level, but the success of it really depends on department level employees using our tools, using our data, and improving their performance based on our work. So uh, this has been a really good guiding light. Before we move on to, um, to where things were at in September 15th, I believe we have a question for you all. So I wanna create space for that. Yep, so you see that on the screen now. Yep, so what we want to ask uh, you guys in the audience is what you believe the most important uh, key success factor is for a data project to be successful. So uh, you have the choices there in front of you. We have vision, goals, technology, journey, leadership, and budget. So if you would like to uh, to vote, uh, we'll, we'll feed that back shortly. So I'll give you all a second or two to throw it away. I'm very curious about what the answers are gonna be. Maybe next time we have some bets, I don't know. Yeah, <laughs> always fun with a bit. Yeah. Um, do you think we should continue? Or should we give a yeah, continue. We've got about half the audience there, so I'll, we'll, we'll just give it another 30 seconds or so. Excellent. Oh, so 
our transitioning. All right, so let's take, join me back in time. This is September 2015. This is where the city of Los Angeles and the mayor's office was at before my team began doing its work. Uh, I started work April 18th, 2015. There was no orientation, there was no training, there was no navigation packet as to what city hall infrastructure looked like. A lot of this innovation, modernization, digitization type work doesn't come with an instruction manual. So uh, you definitely just kind of learn, you, you fly the ship as you build it. So when we talk about real estate, this is where the city of Los Angeles was at. We, I spoke about the mayor. The city has 15 different council districts with their own elected representative. Almost all real estate decisions were driven by those 15 individuals and their very specific, highly localized needs. This created a lot of inconsistencies. It also led to a really lengthy and reactive process. Usually, if a city council member wanted to accomplish something with real estate, he or she would have to create what's called a council motion, which took about six, nine, 12 months to accomplish, which would generate perhaps a list of assets. So, the, the, and, and when I say list of assets, I mean a CSV file that might be saved out as a PDF that would include an address that might or it might not be formatted perfectly, um, that would not necessarily include any contextual information. And I don't know, you tell me how you'd feel after waiting for nine months for an answer and you get a PDF when you wanna know what can I do with land. So it was also a very frustrating process. Um, this also means that there was a lack of strategic leadership. There was nobody that was saying, what does the city need to accomplish with its real estate 10, 15, 20, 30 years from now? Uh, because of this, we saw a lot of ad hoc individual systems, about 15 or so. These, I mean, I say ad hoc systems, I'm really talking about Google Docs, Excel files. I think an access database was the most advanced piece of technology or system that was being used. Um, and this is real estate, right? It, it's, it's built environment. We were managing it as lists, rows and columns, not maps, which was really one of our goals. Additionally, no unique identifier, so it made it really difficult for leadership to use the same language. People thought they would be talking about the same asset, when in reality they would be talking about two totally different things. Uh, and there were no standard hierarchies, which made it really difficult to run analysis and to answer thoughtful questions. So that's where we were at. With that in mind, I'll share now my team's goals. This is really to... It, to zero in on using interactive maps and leveraging flexible, accessible tools that real estate decision makers could access regardless of they were at while keeping security and liability in mind. Uh, we wanted to have standards and move away from individual ad hoc systems to a citywide true asset management system while increasing transparency and being strategic about how we use real estate. We thought that was very, very important. So as I mentioned before, I'm gonna take a quick break. I don't have a slide for this, uh, but I just wanna share two or three existing victories that uh, highlight how these goals are manifesting themselves. One of them is associated with safety. So there was an issue some time back and the Los Angeles Fire Department needed to make a very quick decision. This is a decision that impacts lives, right? Like when, when the fire department gets involved, usually an emergency has happened, risk is happening. Uh, within minutes, the, the folks that now are managing the system were able to find the perfect parcel of land uh, within, I believe, about 10 feet of where the emergency was happening for the fire department to drop the equipment they needed to drop to go address the, the need. I don't, I don't know if it was a fire or robbery that was happening that resulted in, in some emergency. Uh, but within 10 minutes, the right exact parcel of land that met the size criteria and location was found. In the past, no joke, what would have needed to happen to answer those questions is firefighters in other trucks or ambulances would have had to drive around 
to find the location. Drive around. So one example, uh, another key victory that we found is associated with elections. So here in the city of Los Angeles, the city clerk is uh, responsible for finding locations for the polling sites. So where will people go vote? Before us, to answer the question of where are we going to put our locations, where are we going to put our equipment, again, people will just drive around looking for empty lots somewhere in the vicinity of where they thought it would be ideal, try to find a vacant lot and see if it was city owned. Because of our system, within five minutes, we were able to give them five to 10 choices that very clearly showed on a map where what they should consider based on the criteria they provided us. This is really saying efficiency, time is saved, money is saved, resources are saved. We can be more efficient with our dollars because I mean, you know, you have just having people driving around, that's their time, it's the vehicle, it's the roads, you're just wasting time. Um, I'll, I'll share a few more victories as I highlight the technology, but again, creating quick victories and being able to tell them anecdotally as part of a larger conversation is a key learning that we acquired from this project and this exercise. You can quickly shoot one off in an elevator or when you're talking with the people that questioned your work or that are figuring out if they want to support you, uh, but you know that they tie back to the goals of your project. So I wanted to highlight that. We've got the results for that poll question, if oh, you don't mind. Excellent, let's do that. So the, the, the top uh, rating was uh, leadership at 29%, uh, vision and goals equal on 26%, technology on 15%, and journey and budget on 3% each. Interesting. That's cool. Would, would you all be, be down to send me those numbers after? I would just be curious. Sure. Yeah, yeah, most definitely. And, and the audience, don't forget to send through your questions as we go through. Oh, you're, you're saying we have some questions? No, not, not yet, but um, yeah, just to the audience, don't, don't forget to send through your questions in the Q&A button there. Um, all right, excellent. That's really cool. I'm, I'm glad leadership stands out because it's definitely been a, a key part of our success. So clearly we're all thinking alike. All right, let's talk a little bit now about our, our data journey kind of falls in three main buckets. Uh, after I, I share these three main pillars, I'm gonna show you a whole bunch of the tools and different aspects of the technology that we've implemented. Uh, so we strive to centralize our data and set a baseline. Uh, we really aim to institute technology infrastructure that is modern and flexible. And we guide all this with collaborative leadership. So as the mayor's office, we definitely get to drop the hammer every now and then. And if people are not playing nice, we find very, uh, gentle yet aggressive ways of making sure they they do what is needed for the success because this is the city's future we're talking about if you just reflect back to uh, some of the core issues that i spoke about at the end at the beginning homelessness emergencies stuff like that uh, this is more than just politics or bureaucracy there's real real work that needs to happen and so these are kind of the three main pillars that we operated under or operate as we're still doing this work so how did we set a baseline uh, for, for the, the city's assets? Uh, we, we used APIs, which is one of, uh, I think one of the most useful tools in, in how we can clean and, and merge interesting contextual data. Uh, we started with the county assessors open data set. Uh, we worked with them very closely to identify all of the different ways that city ownership was classified um, and we use them to set that initial baseline. Uh, after we identified all the records that we believed were owned by the city, we then did some validation. We, we connected them again via API uh, with their respective polygons, uh, which basically reflect on land what that record or asset looks like. So we use that as our baseline. And then we dropped over that about 55 different data sets from across the city department. These could be two or three column Excel workbooks, one sheet, three columns, address, some notes in definitely no standard, uh, maybe some, some monetary value or some, some random piece of information. Um, we had some that were as few as six assets perhaps, we had others that were as big as 4,000 assets. And 
when we were done with this initial merging and setting up baselines, uh, we started, or be, when we were done with the initial merging of data before we went through our deduping efforts, we landed at uh, 27,000 records. So it, it, it's definitely not a, a super massive data set, but when you consider that this, we're speaking about a real estate portfolio, you're speaking about potentially 27,000 different pieces of property. How, I don't mean, how do you imagine that, right? Like, how do you visualize that? These are all some of the things that we have to think through. So core thing here, uh, APIs as a key way to bring data together. If you go to data.lacounty.gov, you will see as I'm showing on the screenshot, this is totally public. All you need is inter internet connection, a variety of ways to play with this data. The city encourages people to play with it. So that was the first thing, set a baseline, connect all the data sets. Interesting fact, uh, in this exercise, we also learned that there were more than 50 ways that city ownership appeared. Now, this means that there were, there were for example, Los, City of Los Angeles, Los Angeles City, L space A space City, L A space City. We found records where the word Angeles was misspelled. Uh, all kinds, so even though we were very confident that we have all the information, there is really no 100% true way because um, if maybe somebody just totally messed up on the name or maybe new information. So just to say, you know, there's, there's some wiggle room that we have to play with. So let's fix two baseline uh, APIs, data.lacounty.gov, go check it out. I'll be happy to share back with, with your organizers uh, these links if it'll be helpful. Um, I am not, uh, I'm not a data scientist by trade. I did not study computer science or data science. Uh, I've learned on the job. I'm an advertiser and communicator by trade. So storytelling is the main pillar of my career, uh, meaning I had to seek out, I don't know, how, I, I understand, I can project manage API work. I, I don't know how to write APIs and, and write those scripts. So we seeked out an excellent local firm here in Los Angeles. They're a software shop and, and data shop compiler LA. I encourage you to check them out. It's, it's three people, highly dynamic. They're involved in civic technology in all aspects. So um, as, as bureaucracies and governments, I think we have to be better at acknowledging that we don't know everything and we don't have every resource or skill set to accomplish everything. So let's go find the people that are smarter than us to help us accomplish big things. And uh, we very successfully did that. Um, just big on Twitter, just a few additional uh, resources that we used, um, nothing big here, just part of the storytelling component. So uh, I, as I mentioned, one of the key pieces of technology we used to set our baseline was uh, the County Assessor's Open Data Portal, which runs on Socrata. Uh, it's a really fun technology. I encourage you all to check it out. Uh, another key piece of our technology infrastructure is what you're looking at here. It's called ePropertyPlus. property plus. It's a tool that came about about three years ago. A number of municipalities, mostly cities, townships, and counties are using it across the state. They're using it mostly for land banking, which is a practice of selling real estate or, or city owned real estate for economic development or municipal purposes. We're one of the few that has used it to uh, improve its operational, like it, its operations really. Uh, we're, we're one of the few that is saying, okay, how do we use this to modernize the way we, we manage and approach a real estate? Uh, this has a few pieces to it, which I'll speak to in a minute. Uh, the first of which is this, this is the admin view that you're seeing, uh, backend access. It offers a number. It, I, I really like the UI. I think it's very friendly and it's been easy for me to figure out. Uh, how does the deeper discussion thing go? Okay. Um, I'll continue on. Um, all of the fields that you see on the left, they're representative of a really long list of questions or or a really long list of, of ways to query the database. Uh, we have about 60 different fields ranging from street address, which you can drop in a keyword, to parcel size, to uh, what you're seeing here in the drop down. We now have hierarchies, so we understand what comprises what in which way and what leads to what. We have classifications, we have standards, but more importantly, 
we now have maps. This is real estate. This is built environment. Let's move away from list. Let's, let's look at it on a, on a freaking map so we can get a sense of, you know, what's the context for it? That's so important. So here you're seeing a, a great example of that. Um, I mentioned polygons, which are the, the bright purple shapes that you're seeing. This is really important because if you are the city's building maintenance division and you are about to go uh, tend to a building, you should be aware of what is the easiest entrance to that building. Right? So if I just give you an address, you're just going to show up. How do you know where to enter? Perhaps there's um, a hill on one side or there's a river on the other. So knowing what, what's the built environment around it, very, very important. So ePropertyPlus, Plus, a bunch of ways to query it um, and get some great information. I do come from an advertising background. We just got the question, so you can see that. Okay, yeah. great. So yeah, now a bit about your background. How, how did you end up in this position with all that, you know, being not it's in advertising? Interesting. Yeah. Happy to take a break. Uh, let's talk about that. Um, I ended up in this position um, really, I think that I, I spent three years working in Florida for digital advertising agencies, and I was always really interested in the technical aspect of the work. How, how did storytelling and technology merge? And then after three years of working in advertising, I found myself highly dissatisfied with the work that I was doing. And so I packed up my bags, told my parents and uh, the girlfriend that I had been with six months and said, hey, I know we were talking about moving in together, but I'm gonna move to Los Angeles for, for a political campaign uh, and get paid 200 bucks a month and in the poorest part of the city. Uh, so really what I'm saying there is I, I kind of forced my career to align with my passion in a very risky way. Um, and slowly over time, I, I ran the digital department for the political campaign. Then I joined a technology nonprofit that taught uh, underserved youths how to use technology to kind of bring their ideas to life. Uh, so that helped me really understand what facilitating looked like uh, what communicating technology in very simple terms looked like. And that led to a job leading the social media team for uh, a software as a service company that's called Nation Builder. They're based here in Los Angeles. And so I was the guy that was helping sell the technology in South America. I'm, I'm Colombian. I was born in Colombia. So Spanish is my first language. So I was like, hey, one, go sell this technology in Latin America. And that's where I, I had to work with the product team on localizing the technology. So I got to really see the guts of the software. How, how do characters come into a system? How do we tweak the interface to align with what we intend to? Um, and then uh, the, the last little bit here is that uh, about a year before I started working at the mayor's office, I connected with an, uh, an individual who was working at the city via Twitter. And then um, we just kind of came up with coffee one day to just he was working at the mayor's office. I, he was a potential customer, so for me it was a business development meeting. And uh, we became acquaintances and friends. And then a year later, he was being recruited to be the director of this team that I'm in. And he wanted a data storyteller hybrid and thought I was that person. And so now I am giving you all in Australia a webinar on how data and storytelling help build Elliot's portfolio. So, so take risks, use Twitter, use social media. We've got another question there, one. Uh, do you use Google Maps or another map data source? So no, we, we've spoken about ePropertyPlus. Mm -hmm. um, so should you like to just explain the mapping, what the mapping, you know, interactive mapping tool is behind the scenes there? Property Plus pulls from Google's API. Uh, it uses uh, Google Maps, which I think is cool because most of our users at the city level are not very advanced. So the way they're used to seeing real estate is through Google Maps, or at least the, the, the land around them, you know, where they're going to go. Uh, so that was very useful. We, uh, in a little bit, I'll highlight how we use Esri RTIS. Uh, I'm personally really curious about how we can get the city to OpenStreetMaps and MapBox and more open source elements. 
Um, but that's a really weird debate because to really leverage open source, you need like, technical folks that are interested and intrigued in supporting the environment. So uh, you can like that. So that's that's a balance there. But that's that's really the mapping infrastructure that we do. Great. All right. Thank you. That's actually a great segue into shapefiles. Um, if you all go to geohub.lacd.org, you will find a wealth of data sets that speak to the city of Los Angeles's geospatial information. To parks, to uh, where the schools are, all types of analysis are readily available. You can play with them and download them via APIs, CSV files, um, what is it, uh, a Google file format, it's like K something that escapes my mind. Almost every, state file, every, every file format you need will be there. Uh, this is important because one thing we did, which has been really, really successful in getting people excited about the work that we're doing. I identified the uh, ePropertyPlus Plus only holds 25 additional shape files. So I, I sat down one day in front of my computer uh, with a large cup of coffee and went through every shape, every data set in the city's geo hub and identified the the 50 that I think made most sense for the system we were implementing. So on the left side of your screen, you're seeing all of the mental health centers in the county of Los Angeles. As I mentioned before, homelessness uh, is, is one of the, is really the city's top priority right now because it impacts all aspects of, of lifestyle and the economy. Mental health is a huge, huge part of homelessness. So if a council member or the mayor is having a conversation about where to place transitional housing units or permanent housing or homelessness relief efforts, I think aware of where existing homelessness shelters and services are, right? That's context. These are, these are additional data points that help you make the best well-informed decision. Uh, we also added things like bike share kiosks, all of the bus lanes, uh, all the metro stations, job training centers. So I thought about, you know, what are some key areas, transportation, economic development, civic engagement. And I exported those out from the GeoHub as shape files and imported them into ePropertyPlus property plus uh, as, as what I, in, in my trainings with city staff, I refer to them as community layers. So uh, it helps the users make really well-informed decisions. That kind of covers shape files. Um, we have a few more slides. I know this is conversation oriented. Uh, gentlemen, feel free to stop me again if there are additional questions or, or any thoughts. Okay. What I'm showing you on the slide is a portion of the numerous layers that make up the city government. In the next slide, all of the blue circles represent a portion of all of the entities which we have trained on using the system. And when I say trained, I mean me and my team go schedule a one hour to an hour and a half meeting with the real estate relevant group of people uh, at the different council districts, uh, within the library system, the Department of Cultural Affairs, Parks and Recreation, and they teach them how to use the system. After I teach them how to use the system, I send them a small library tutorial of, of video tutorials that are broken up into three to four minute segments that highlight that same functionality. And this was something I created uh, from my days at Nation Builder selling software. Users face similar learning curves. So instead of explaining how to search for X, I can quickly create a screencast video using Jing, which is a screen capture software. Uh, to show the clicks while I narrate along. So I, I, I did a general feature store, how to search and filter, how to use the maps. And it's really just me clicking on the screen and narrating along, but I'm, I'm one person. I cannot support a hundred users. You know, that's just a lot of other ways to do it. Uh, and it's really just a nice way to build rapport. You know, they hear my voice once and they hear it again. It builds trust. Uh, and we have a navigation guide, and uh, we also have a Google form, which we use as a record update form, so they can uh, 
made updates to records. Not everybody has admin level licenses, so they can't actively edit data. So we're figuring out the workflows so that we admins update the records now that we have a central database. Uh, and we'll be having our first user meeting in about two weeks, so our user group meeting. So now that we have hit kind of a, a, a critical mass as far as user acquisition goes at the city level, we want to gather them up, share best practices, express frustrations, like with technology, I'm sure there is a bunch of frustrations, which is really cool, uh, but it will be a good way to build community. I think with, with any piece of technology, this conversation, George, the Australian Computer Societies, this is all great examples of, of how community has a role in the success of technology-driven startups. Um, a great aspect of eProxy Plus is that it has a public-facing component, which is what you're looking at right now. Uh, this is not live. The URL you're seeing at the top is not live yet. It is the eventual home of the system. So we can even look at something that even Angelinos haven't seen, which is kind of cool. <laughs> and and it allows us. This is the the home page for this portal. In the bottom, there's three circles you see. These are specific properties I've selected to feature. Search properties, which are meant to highlight diversity in the portfolio. So on the on the left, you see a community center which the city owns. In the middle, that's a piece of vacant land. That is, I kid you not, beach size in Malibu. This lot in itself is easily worth three, four, five million dollars, and it is just ridden by weeds. And I don't know th that in the very at the very end has those trees. What you're seeing there is the Malibu Mountains, which border the ocean. So, if anybody's looking for a piece of land for a vacation home, let me know. I work on commission. Uh, I'm just kidding. That's a conflict of interest. I can't do that. <laughs> Uh, and then the last bubble, it's, it's a park. So the city owns all kinds of things. Uh, and I thought it was important to show the breadth of that. Um, the image in the background is just one of the images that the city owns. And so I, I made sure I got some images approved by the mayor's communications department at the beginning of this project. So that I had some digital assets to help me with my visual storytelling component. And then the search box you see allows people to just drop in an address or a personal number or view all of the properties. What you're seeing here is very similar to the back-end interface, but this is the public-facing part, so it's a little more limited. Uh, it offers most of the same searching fields. We, we decide which ones to make available, and we're only showing about 1,800 of the properties. Um, if it was up to me, I would share everything, but there's a lot of sensitivities around real estate. There are existing projects that are underway, and also the truth is city, the city doesn't have the bandwidth to take in the number of requests and phone calls and emails that will inevitably come in uh, from the real estate community wanting to buy a lot, from local communities wanting to know why there are so many vacant lots in their neighborhood, why is this land not being leveraged. And so here I'm sharing with you all the, the modernization of the city's infrastructure when you're talking about human resources, that is an entire other layer that moves way slower, dramatically slower. And it's something to definitely consider. Uh, when you implement, uh, if I, you know, if I give you a car that can move 100 miles faster than your old car, can you drive that car? Just because you have it, can you maximize it? Can you really use it? So, Kind of having that drip of, of user acquisition and growth is, is really important. Um, you can do all kinds of things. We, we also made uh, the same community layers that I showed you in the back end, homelessness shelters, schools, bikeways. We made all of that available on the front end, and we will be doing a roadshow tour with all of the folks that care about this. So we're talking about civic hackers who love mapping. Maptime LA is a global organization. They meet every Thursday to talk about how they can they can make life better using maps. They should know about this. We're going to be with community groups who care about what happens at their local level. They should be aware of this tool. Um, last on my list will be real estate developers because LA is largely managed. Like real estate developers have a lot of influence here, and um, we have to really balance how we bring access to groups. Uh, we don't want this to be a conversation that suddenly the mayor's office delivered a tool for real estate developers. We need to see the mayor's office create a transparency and access for all 
So that is, that is, those are the political elements we have to navigate. Um, just got four more slides for you. Well, really three. Um, two more on the tools and then next steps, and then we just kind of open the discussion. Uh, what you're seeing here is what's called a story map. It is an awesome feature of um, Esri ArcGIS technology. This, this lives within our GeoHub. It will go live at the same time that the public facing portal goes live. So the public facing portal does not allow for storytelling. It allows for the discovery of information. It allows for you to explore. Uh, we knew that we needed a component that just told our story, that highlighted our data process to complete the picture and to validate and to build trust and really to drive engagement as well. So uh, what this does is if you go, uh, whenever it goes live, if you go to it, uh, it looks a little bit like this. It allows for one pane to be kind of static. The left side of the screen is static, mostly text. It also showcases some images. Uh, we have some videos embedded. Uh, and what we do is we highlight our story, the goals, and then we give three use cases of how the system is being used. I'm showing you all surplus properties. Uh, surplus properties are individual properties that the city has decided that can be sold and leveraged for economic development and municipal purposes. There's a lot of obscurity around that process, so we wanted to create transparency around it. So there, we highlight that story. On the right side, what you're seeing, the white shape, these are, these are the shape files for the city's business improvement districts, which are basically areas, very designated areas, usually just a handful of blocks, where the city needs to contribute uh, a small tax to improve that area, meaning uh, cleanliness, crime prevention, beautification efforts, anything to drive more traffic there and, and improve the, the business environment. Uh, I think this is an important story to highlight uh, because if you're thinking about which property to leverage for economic development, and if that is perhaps a commercially zoned property, the proximity to a business improvement district or an area that is currently embracing business development, that proximity should inform something. So there's one in particular that I want to highlight for you all. Um, it is the only, there are only two, two, prop, two green dots inside of white area, white shape. Those two properties, in my opinion, and you know, I don't know that it matters to policy leaders, but in my opinion, those two properties should be prioritized for economic development purposes because they're in areas where you have local buy-in from business leaders and from business owners that, hey, we want to do something great here. Well, as a city, I think that means we should do something great with it as well. So some examples of how we're using this technology. Uh, once it, this will live in GeoHub, so you can go to geohub.lac.org and again, find all kinds of wonderful information there. Uh, the last thing, so I think this is a good stopping point for one of our next questions before I go into the next steps portion of, of this discussion. Uh, if you want to shoot off that next question, we can do that now. Sure. Okay, so Juan, you mentioned that uh, you started with 27,000 chunks of land or land parcels, and by overlaying the layers on top of each other, you're able to deduplicate those 27,000 land parcels down to a lesser number. So uh, we've got a poll. Uh, so we've got 27,000, so unchanged, uh, 17,000, 13,000, and 10,000. So these are the, the numbers of parcels left after the deduplication effort. Exactly. So we want to give folks a few seconds to, to yeah. answer yes. Sure. So no one has responded with 27,000 yet. Oh, interesting. interesting. Yeah, I would, I would hope nobody takes that guess because otherwise a lot of our work would have been for nothing if everything was <laughs> the same. <laughs> I don't know where you want me to jump back in. Yeah. No worries. Couple more coming through. Cool. I'm excited to see what people got. Go back to 
you should be able to see that now. Oh, so cool. All right. Should I share the number? I think I think what was interesting was the story where it, in, a, in a process you ended up navigating down to each of those numbers, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, but, but the final one, the final one was probably the one related to the question, so. Yeah, so um, the way, so we started at 27. Upon the first removal of, of duplicates, um, based on either matching um, assessor parcel numbers, which is the closest thing we have to a unique identifier, uh, this only works within the county of Los Angeles. So the city owns land in the city of Los Angeles, the county of Los Angeles, the state of California, and other states. Uh, so this identifier only works in certain, for, for a majority of the portfolio, not all of them. Um, so that got us down to 17,000. I removed it strictly based off APNs. Uh, and then for those records that we didn't have an APN for, what we did was uh, we, we basically geocoded the address and if the pin landed oh and just by the way 17,000 is not the answer I'm giving you all the, the journey so whoever gets 17,000 I'm sorry you got it wrong uh, <laughs> we, uh, we if if the pin if the address if an address which lacked an APN landed I think we set a buffer like a two foot buffer around the the APN location if it landed there, then we merged it into the record. So that initial wave of deduplicating got us down to 17,000. Then after 17,000, um, we did an, oh, we, we ran the, our remaining records through uh, what's called a parcel change. I always struggle with, it's a sequence of words that just for some reason escaped my mind. Parcel file change history. Um, the county assessor only cares about assets that change hands and need to be reassessed because that generates the county money. And so they have this file that basically says, this parcel of land uh, in this last year got split up into two five, into five new parcels, or these five parcels got split up into, or, or got merged into one, for example. That, uh, that updating of information got us down to 13, and then, uh, and then, so if you, got, if you guessed 13, you got it wrong. Uh, then what happened was that I realized I had made a mistake. And so that mistake led to me having, I think, two, two new ownership names that should not be on there uh, because they were acronyms. And so that was my rookie mistake being new to the city and not knowing the millions of acronyms that exist. Um, it, it, it spoke to other kind of county or federal agencies. And so when we identified that mistake, that got us down to the 10,000 records, which make up the city portfolio. So if you guess 10,000, congrats, give yourself a pat on the back. Uh, we'll play the lotto. It's a good day to make some guesses. Thanks. Yeah, excellent, excellent question. Um, all right, so what's next for the success of this project? Uh, as I mentioned, we will be launching the public facing portal for ePropertyPlus Plus to drive more transparency uh, across the city, to showcase some of our properties, better leverage property for economic and municipal development purposes. Uh, additionally, we will actually be moving away from ePropertyPlus Plus in about a year and a half to a true real estate asset management system. So what I showed you all was information at the parcel or structural level so the building the piece of land as it works will eventually tell us how much space we have available at the room at every room inside of that building uh what key pieces of you know does the does the water heater somewhere need to be changed like and a, a true kind of management component to it uh, at a way deeper level so we will be either using an api feed to move the data over, or we will have to do a mass export and then map the, the columns to AssetWorks and reconfigure the system. But now that the data has been cleaned and centralized, that should not be a big problem. Um, as a team, part of this, you know, I've talked technology, but I work in government, which means policy is a part of the equation. So we'll be 
exploring a new uh, strategic asset management model that is not driven by the council or even really the city. It will be kind of a hybrid nonprofit model that takes away some of the political components. Uh, we will continue standardizing data, data validation, data will never be 100% perfect. Uh, but now that it's clean, we'll be able to expand. Um, we'll, we'll be able to really expand the the what we collect. So I mentioned the availability of room. Six months ago, we didn't even know what we own. So if you ask me, what room can I move into? I would say, well, man, let me answer. What do we own? Because we don't really know that yet. So uh, now we can capture more insightful data. And this is key. I spoke about the human component of this work and how the human element is moves sometimes slower than the technology component. The analyzing the talent of the city when it comes to real estate operations. So do we have people that can run these systems? Do we have people that understand how real estate operations work and what strategic asset management looks like? Uh, if not, how do we close those gaps? So that's what's coming next. Um, and that concludes this portion of the discussion. So now we can just kind of have some free flowing talk. Ooh, I'm concerned you all are frozen. Are you all there? Oh, no. Hello? Okay, do you all hear me in the, in the chat room? I'm glad you all hear me. Mm. Do you all see Ross? Okay. No. Oh, so this is not my internet. Well, then, oh, I think you're back. Yeah. Um, while we get him back, do you all have any questions for me, oh, Ross? Yeah. Sorry about that. It's Sorry, on. just technical issue. Everyone's on. No, we're still going. Yeah. Excellent. Thank you. Yeah. So uh, that that concludes it. I think this is a good time. Um, I don't know if you do. You all want me to repeat the next steps? I don't know if we missed that part or if we can just transition to Q and A. Yeah, maybe just the last um, the last couple of minutes there. Uh, just just after you were talking about how we we're demerging all that data and. What are we doing next? We're talking about the uh, room. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so we're transitioning to a better system that lets us capture more specific information kind of at the room level, uh, lets us track more financial information, so deeper data collection. Uh, we're exploring a new governmental entity to help us run our and manage our assets so that decisions are not driven by policymakers, but instead by true real estate professionals. Uh, that will liaise with, with the city government. Uh, we'll keep working to standardize and validate our data. Um, and the last thing that is really important speaks to the human element of this. And it is that um, we're going we're gonna to keep analyzing the talent. Do we have the type of employees and skill sets? I mean, we know the answer is no. So it's like, how do we get our, our employees to a level where they can maximize these new tools? where um, they can be true asset managers. And so that's what's coming next. Uh, I see there's a question here from Boris. Should I, should I tackle that? Cool. So Boris asks, Juan, what would you say have been the challenges you have faced understanding IT coming from an advertising background and also dealing with the political dynamics? That's an excellent question. Uh, I'm going to pair that apart into the two uh, and I'm going to stop sharing my screen so we can look at each other. That'll be a little better. Uh, there we go. So uh, I'll tear that apart, answer each one first, or answer the advertising background first. I think, I don't know if you all are familiar with this term, um, imposter syndrome. It is something that basically says, am I good enough? Like, am I good enough to tackle this opportunity? Am I, gonna, am I good enough to face this learning curve? It is not... You know, I'm, 
like I'm learning SQL. That's it's not the technical aspect of things. You know, there's a million YouTube videos and tutorials and in-world tech classes that have all brought forth really interesting and unique learning curves. But I think it's just like my own self-confidence, knowing that I didn't go to school for a technical degree, and now I have to sit in rooms and either pretend like I know until I figure it out, or choose the exact versions of words. Um, so it's that. It's just it, you know, getting over myself, getting over my own fears, and uh, being committed enough to my own learning that I can comfortably acknowledge that I'm not a trained data professional, but that I am now a data practitioner and that I'm working very hard to become better and better at that. Um, and that I honestly, like now I have this under my belt along with the wealth of other projects. So, you know, I'm getting there. Uh, the second question is more around dealing with political dynamics. Man, that's tough. I'm not, I'm not somebody, I care about the work. I care about the results. Um, I find it very difficult to deal with sensitivities when they are unwarranted. Uh, and the political dynamics have oftentimes distracted away from the true impact of the work. Um, so the way I deal with that is by, uh, I run a lot after work, so I find ways to vent my frustrations in, in productive ways. Uh, and then I also let the work speak for itself. So when, when folks see the result, you can't really argue with technology. These are maps, you know, these are things that are tangible and you can go play with and the system lives in the internet. So good luck taking that down. Uh, so just allowing the work to reflect the goodwill, that's been key. What, oh my God, that second question about the changing world. So the shifting earth uh, is forever changing by small degrees. What is your strategy to deal with that? Uh, I guess we need to invest in an excellent geocoding service that adjusts for that and then I guess it comes down to data refreshes um, but honestly that's like I had never considered that you're right the earth moves let me get back to you we'll, I'll come up with a can better I, answer can I, th can I throw one at you there one and this is this is a little bit on the same track and that is how do you deal with changes in electoral boundaries, for example, where there's potentially um, going to be some different impacts. So um, how do you sort of deal with that? Has that come across? Has that been a problem you've had to solve yet? Um, it's, we haven't had to solve it. We've had to be aware of it for quite some time. Because we had elections, we had mayoral elections not too long ago. Uh, we've also had a few council district elections. Uh, in that same time. Luckily, political boundaries only change uh, at the city level, at least, every four to six years. Usually when those boundaries change, what is presented to the public and what is shared around is not a shapefile. It is a, 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 a community map that lives as a PDF. That is going to do nothing for my system. Uh, and we've already had conversations. I think it's with the, we have to talk to the city clerk and with the city planning department, I believe, uh, so that when the city clerk is making changes, we know that city planning will reflect those changes as shape files or uh, e property plus the way it manifests polygons is through a WKT format. I had never come across that until uh, approaching e property plus. Uh, so just letting people be aware that, hey, for this to be useful and reflected, um, your, your ultimate deliverable, and that's cool. If you want to make a beautiful PDF that you can post on a website as a JPEG, because we can't even really do a PDF, that, but for the city to benefit, we need, we need shape files or some version of that. Sure. Great. Is there, is there any more questions from the audience at all? Well, good. Everyone seems pretty happy with that. Um, Peter, do you want to close? Good stuff. Well, look, thanks, uh, thanks, Juan. Well, I only saw you speak about four weeks ago now, yeah. and uh, you know, I I learned a lot the second time. Uh, so and I was paying attention the first time. So I uh, certainly appreciate uh, the story, and uh, yeah, thanks very much for presenting today to the ACS.
Perfect. And, and you know, on behalf of myself and the audience, we thank you for your time and really appreciate look forward to, to working with you again. Of course. I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you all for being dedicated listeners. And uh, I hope this was valuable. Uh, I hope to chat with you all again soon. Excellent. Thank you. Take care. Brilliant. Bye-bye.